The uh, last lecture that I uh, worked on the energy levels for a, a particle, a charged particle moving in the uniform magnetic field, and I've summarized some of the calculations here on the board. Uh, the main result was the energy levels, uh, which depend on two quantum numbers, M, which is the Landau quantum number, and then P3, which is the momentum uh, parallel to the uh, magnetic field. You know, the particle moves as a free particle in that direction. Uh, and uh, the uh, lambda level corresponds to a harmonic oscillator with energy input to half h part omega. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, the q and the p of the uh, harmonic oscillator are basically the x and y components of the velocity, which don't commute with each other. So the harmonic oscillator itself is really just vx squared plus vy squared times m over 2 as kinetic energy. This is the quantized values of the perpendicular kinetic energy of the of the particle. In fact, the whole energy is kinetic energy. Um, anyway, that was the uh, main result of the uh, last lecture. And uh, in this lecture, what I'd like to do is to start by working on the, uh, not just the energy levels, but also the uh, energy item functions. So, uh, let me start with the board here. And get um, to work on that. Uh, so, um, the uh, strategy is going to be uh, to uh, choose a complete set of commuting observables, a CSCO. Uh, and uh, for starters, we can take uh, the, for starters, we may notice that the perpendicular Hamiltonian and the parallel Hamiltonian uh, commute with each other. I'll have to keep lifting this up to show you the summary from last time. But the reason they do is that you know, there's three degrees of freedom. One, which is uh, basically the guiding center position, x and y, the q and the p. The two degree of freedom is the x and y components of velocity. And the three degree of freedom is the z and pz in the uh, parallel direction. So uh, the reason that uh, the reason that h perp and h parallel commute with each other is that h perp only involves number two degree of freedom, whereas h parallel involves number three. So they commute with each other because the commutation relations are q i p j is uh, i h bar delta i j. So the commutators are zero for different degrees of freedom. So uh, the Hamiltonian is the sum of two terms that commute with each other. And so we can take these two terms, h, h perp and h parallel, as being two of our members of a complete set of commuting observables. Let's write this set like this. <coughs> now actually, as it turns out, instead of h perp, h, excuse me, instead of h parallel, it's actually better to use p3 the parallel component of momentum. This is really just a one-dimensional free particle. And the uh, idea here is, is that you, momentum is preferable because the energy is degenerate. You know, in a free particle in one dimension, you've got two waves traveling in opposite directions have the same energy. That's resolved if you use the momentum as the quantum number. So allow me to do that and replace h parallel just by p3, like this. Uh, that gives us uh, two commuting observables. Uh, but we need another one, uh, the, and it's pretty clear that we do because the number one degree of freedom uh, is not represented by h parallel and h perp. That's the x and y, the guiding center positions. So if we want to find a third uh, observable which commutes with the, the first two, it obviously can be any function of q1 and p1. Uh, or for that matter, it could be call it x and y. It's the same thing apart from these constants. So it's the guiding center position, some function of m. And uh, the simplest choice is, is just to take it to be x. We can make it y. Let's, let's make it x just to give it a choice. So let's take a complete set of commuting observables, and we'll take it to be x, h perp, and p3. And our strategy then will be to find a, um, a, a set of simultaneous eigenfunctions of those observables. All right. So what we're going to look for then is, a, uh, is to solve a set of equations like this. We've got a wave function that's going to be psi of x, y, and z. And we want, first of all, that x acting on this, the operator, brings out an eigenvalue we'll call x. And uh, you can see I better distinguish the operator from the eigenvalue. So let me use my usual trick of putting hats on any operator where I think there's going to be a confusion between the operator and a and in an eigenvalue or some other C number. Uh, so anyway, this is the eigenvalue, uh, eigenfunction equation for the operator x hat. Likewise, we'll have h, h perp acting on the same psi. We'll bring out an e perp, perpendicular energy. And we'll have a p3 hat acting on psi. We'll bring out a p3 eigenvalue acting on psi. 
fold time sky. So these are three simultaneous eigenvalue equations in F3 satisfy. Now, <coughs> uh, the, uh, so let's work on these. Uh, the uh, H perp is the most complicated of all, uh, and the P3 and X hat are simpler. So let's do the simple ones first. Let's work on P3 hat first. Uh, P3 hat uh, is, is from the formula down here. It's the mass times Vz. And Vz, the velocity, is expressed in terms of the canonical momentum of the vector potential by this equation. So we put those together. P3 hat then is equal to the mass times Vz. I'll put a hat on Vz. And that's the same thing as momentum Pz plus E over C times the vector potential Az, which in general depends on x, y, and z. And so this eigenvalue uh, equation, the third eigenvalue equation, looks like this now. It becomes, replacing Pz by the operator minus I h bar Dz. We get an equation like this minus i h bar d z plus d over c uh, times a sub z, which is a function of x, y, and z, acting on psi is equal to eigenvalue p3 times psi, same psi of x, y, and z. <coughs> now, what makes this equation hard to solve is the vector potential component a sub z. And so we ask ourselves, is it possible to choose a gauge? Let's try to choose a gauge now to simplify the equations. Can we choose a gauge such that az is equal to zero? And that'd be done. Uh, well, let's write out the, uh, the equations, the components of v equals del cross a. Uh, if we take the z component, we have v, which is the same as the z component. It's uh, at dA y with respect to x minus partial ax with respect to y. Just write up the full equations. Zero, which is dx, is equal to uh, partial az with respect to y minus partial ay with respect to z. And zero, which is dy, which is the third component, is equal to partial ax with respect to z minus partial ac with respect to x. Just writing out the curl. <coughs> now. Uh, if az is equal to zero, if we provisionally guess that, that we can do that, then these two terms here go away. And you can see that what's left is, is that dAy with respect to z is equal to zero, and also dAx with respect to z is equal to zero. So these equations imply that Ax is a function only of x and y now, and it also the same is true for Ay is only a function of x and y. That az is equal to zero. This means, as you can see, that the entire vector potential is now independent of z. So partially the whole vector potential with respect to z is equal to zero. Um, this means that uh, it's, uh, the vector potential is invariant on the translations in the z direction. This is one of the symmetries of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is uniform in the z direction like this. It obviously has a symmetry, a translational symmetry in the z direction. If you move it up and down, it doesn't change anything. You can also move it to the right and left or backwards and forward, and that doesn't change anything either. The magnetic field has a symmetry, a translational symmetry in all three directions. It also has a rotational symmetry about the z-axis. Only about the z-axis, not about the other axis. But anyway, this magnetic field, this uniform magnetic field, has four obvious symmetries. So now one of them is reproducing the vector potential, namely the z. Translational symmetry. So let's let's do that. Let's make this assumption. And if we do that, things this up because this term goes away. And uh, also, if we do that, then this term goes away. And we see that P3, the operator, is the same as the Pz operator. So let's just change notation now to the same thing. So let's just take P3 hat and just replace it by Pz because that's what it is. And likewise, do the same for the eigenvalue. We replace that by Pz. So I'll take this. And Place this just by Pz. And so now the equation is easy to solve, and it gives you psi of x, y, and z is equal to e to the i Pz times z over h bar times an arbitrary function of x and y. Because we're in the x and y derivatives here, this is the general solution of that equation. And so the z-dependence is determined, and it turns into, a, as you see, a plane wave in the z-direction. Logical sense, the motion in the z-direction is that of a free particle. 
All right. Anyway, this takes care of the, the third eigenvalue equation, which is the P3 equation. Now, the next most easiest, the next easiest one to work with is, is the X equation, so let's do that. I'll try to start it here, and then I'll just shift to another board. So the X, I'll remind you, the X, the guiding center X is defined as the coordinate X minus VY over omega, and VY is given in terms of canonical minimum effect potential by the standard formula. So in terms of operators there, and this says that the guiding center operator X hat is equal to the particle position X hat minus uh, VY hat over omega, and that's the same thing as particle position x hat minus 1 over m omega times py hat uh, plus e over c a y, which we now know is a function only of x and y. And that's an expression for the x operator. I'm putting hats of everything where I uh, want to distinguish an operator from a number. And so the equation x hat psi is equal to x psi, the eigenvalue equation, turns into the differential equation, which I could write out like this. It becomes x minus 1 over m omega. And then we've got minus i h bar d dy, that's with the py here, plus e over c, a of x and y. And that whole thing multiplies our psi of x, y, z, and gives us eigenvalue x times psi of x, y, z. Now, however, the psi, as already determined, is a phase factor in the z direction times an unknown function of the x and y, of x and y variables. We're going to determine this phi function by using these other two eigenvalue conditions. And in particular, plugging, the, plugging, in, plugging in this uh, expression for, for the psi at this point into the, into the inside the two sides of this equation, you can see there aren't any z derivatives or anything else that depends on z on either side of this equation. And thus, the phase factor of the ipz over h bar, pzz over h bar, just cancels. And so, let me get this up to another board here. Oh, uh, yeah, so it just, they, those just cancel and it ends up being, being just an equation in y. Before I lift it up, I want to do one more thing. Now, uh, Having done that, uh, there's still, this still is not exactly an easy looking equation. And the main reason is, again, because of the spectrum potential here. Uh, but in addition, there's also this x over here. So before proceeding, let's ask whether we can take this vector potential and use it to cancel out that x. It's there on the other side. Let me make that happen. Is that a supposed to be ax? That's supposed to be ax, yes, thank you. <coughs> ax, indeed. Uh, no, excuse me, it's AY. Because this is the this is the PY, which came from the DY, yes. Uh, all right, so uh, can we do that? Um, well, if we do, if those two terms cancel, then the X here is a minus sign, one over M omega, and a plus sign here. So what we'd have to get is a condition that says that X is equal to uh, E over M omega C times a y, or obviously a y is equal to m c over e times omega, which is e d over m c times x, and m c is canceled and the e is canceled, and so this leads to a y is equal to x times b. If we do that. Now, if ay is equal to x times b, then this term in the curl equation is just equal to b. So b equals b, and therefore ea x dy must be equal to zero. And so the logical choice for ax is to take ax equals to zero. Um, and if we do this, of course, these are now they are functions of x and y, they're really only a function of x. If we do this, we now have a specific, uh, completely, completely determined the gauge here. And there's a pretty good choice of gauge. And you can see that the uh, vector potential now has only a y component, and the y component depends only on x. This means that now not only is the vector potential independent of z, but it's also independent of y. 
So it's translationally invariant also in the y direction, both the y and the z directions. It is not, however, translationally invariant in the x direction. And it better not be, because if it were, it would have to be zero. I mean, it would have to be constant. If it were constant, then the magnetic field would be zero. And the magnetic field is not zero. So there's a moral in this, which is the vector potential can never have all the symmetries of the magnetic field. It can have some of them, but not all of them. In any case, here we've set it up so it has the y and z translational invariance, but not the x. All right. Anyway, uh, this is now given as a complete choice of gauge. And uh, we can now solve this x equation. And uh, so it's going to look like this. It's pretty easy to solve. So it's going to be, I just need to clean this stuff up here. The, the x and the a are going to cancel out. And the rest of it is, is I, get, I get an ih bar over m omega dby from here and here. And that x on what's going to be phi, and that's in y. And that's equal to capital X times phi of x and y. Capital X is the hiding value of the hiding center position operator. And this is easy to solve. It says that phi of x and y is equal to e to the minus i m omega times capital X times y divided by h bar times an arbitrary function of x. So as you see, uh, by taking care of the x hat equation, we've now gotten the, the unknown uh, eigenfunction down to just a one, one variable x. And so this, uh, this still leaves us finally with just h perp. So let's now write down the h perp equation. So h perp as, as an operator is, is 1 half uh, m times dx squared plus dy squared. That's the pass on these if you like. This is the same thing as 1 over 2m px plus e over cax squared plus 1 over 2m dy plus e over cay squared. Of course, we've just decided that ax is 0, so that goes out. And uh, px here is going to turn into minus sine h bar dx. As far as e over cay is concerned, the ay is up here. It's, it's x times b. So this is bb over c times x, which if I multiply and divide by the mass, turns into m omega times x. That's the particle position x. As far as the py is concerned, that's uh, minus i h bar d dy. What this is going to act on, well, we don't need to let it act on the full function psi because the, the z variables don't appear anywhere in h part, so the z phase factor will just drop out. So what we want to let it act on is, is, a, phase, is a function phi. And the function phi is a phase factor in y times f of x. Now, the y derivatives do appear. They appear right there. But they're going to act on this phase factor and bring down a constant. As you can see, the d dy is going to be minus i h bar times, as you see here, this is in other words going to turn into a constant factor, which is going to be m omega times capital X, just a multiplication by it, and I think it's going to minus sign, minus m omega capital X. All right. And so after that's been done, then the, there's going to be a common base on the, on the equation h, h per phi is equal to e per phi. This is the equation we want to solve. There's a common phase factor. This y dependent phase factor is on both sides, and we can cancel that. And so what's left over when we clean all this up is, is, is this. It's minus h bar squared over 2m times b squared dx squared. It's an equation just in the unknown function f, you see. Uh, then what we get is m omega squared over 2 times x minus capital X squared. This all acts on f of x gives us e curve f of x. <coughs> now, <coughs> this equation is the uh, eigenvalue equation for a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. You can see there's a short one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. 
there's a kinetic energy. Here's the potential energy, frequency omega. The only thing that's a little bit funny about it is the origin has been shifted from x equals zero over to x equals capital X, which is the eigenvalue of the guiding center operator. And so we can write down the energies in the solute and the eigenfunctions right away. The energy is e, e part per minute e to the n plus a half h bar omega. That's something we do already. And the energy eigenfunctions f of x are going to be equal to what we call the let me call the uh, harmonic oscillator eigenfunctions just use it in. This is the usual Hermite polynomials times exponentials. But it's evaluated at the shifting position x minus x. And so we can now put the whole solution together. I mean, have psi, the wave function, which is characterized by the quantum numbers capital X, lambda quantum number n, momentum in the z direction, which is a function of x, y, and z, is equal to e to the i pzz over h bar to the z direction minus i m omega capital X times y over h bar from the y direction times un of x minus capital X for the x, x, uh, the x variable, and that's the solution. So those are the, those are the wave functions. These are the simultaneous eigenfunctions of these uh, three commuting operators, uh, which we chose as a complete set. And um, the, uh, uh, because the Hamiltonian is a function of those operators, in particular just the last two of them, uh, the uh, energies, the total energies are parallel plus the perpendicular energies. Yes? Our argument for why we need a third uh, complete dead community and searchable thing was that um, we had still two, three, um, we still had x and y. The Initial position. Um, yes. But we used, we chose x and not y, so don't you still have another degree of freedom that's not represented? Well, this, uh, this system has three degrees of freedom. You can see that in the original x, y, and z, which were just the coordinates of the particle. But then we also transformed them to these q's, and there, there was three qp pairs. It's the same number of degrees of freedom. But in the Hamiltonian, there's only two degrees of freedom that appear, the number two and the number three degree of freedom. The guidance center positions x and y don't appear, and that's because the energy doesn't depend on on, uh, on those where it doesn't depend where in the plane you put the circle. Um, so in order to find an eigenfunction, you, you need to have a third, you need to have a third operator who commutes with the first two. And it has to be a function of the guiding center variance, because the other two take care of degrees of freedom number two and three, and guiding center variables are number one. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. However, there was a lot of arbitrariness in the choice of this operator. It could have been any function of, of the number one variables. It could have been y, it could have been some function of, of x and y. It still would have commuted the remaining two. Now, this is a way of saying that there's lots of ways of writing down energy eigenfunctions that have the same energy eigenvalue. And energy eigenvalue depends only on the last two quantum numbers, the n and the pz. So this is a way of saying this is a highly degenerate, uh, degenerate uh, uh, system for given energies so there's many different ways of writing down about uh, energy eigenfunctions. The reason it's so degenerate is because it's highly symmetric. If you include physical effects to break the symmetry, realistic magnetic fields don't go on forever in X and Y. They have to end somewhere. In a solid, there's going to be an end of the solid. Or there's also going to be the potentials, or electric potentials or something. And that, that'll break the symmetry. And then the Hamiltonian will depend on X and Y. And uh, that, that'll change things. But anyway, this is the uh, simplified model. Okay, if we take a, uh, let's take this uh, wave function and sketch it to see what it looks like and try to get some ideas what it means. <coughs> if I uh, notice, notice the uh, z and the y dependence from space factors, so if we square them, they drop out, and all that's left is this harmonic oscillator eigen function. Uh, if we plot this in the xy plane and kind of ignore the z direction, let me put in a dotted line here for uh, where the particle position is equal to the guiding center position. Uh, and let's also take n equals zero, which is the, the ground state of the Landau, Landau motion. Then u n of x, and u n is, is Gaussian, but it's going to be centered on, on at, at, at x equals x. So you get a Gaussian that looks like this, except it extends out in the y direction. So uh, it it's, uh, continues everywhere in the y. If I include the z direction, it would be a kind of a Gaussian wall. It would be out here well, like this, but just in the xy plane, it's like a Gaussian mountain range, which is centered at x equals x. 
Now, this doesn't look at all like uh, classical motion. Classical motion is a circle in the XY plane situated somewhere like this. And what's the relationship between this energy eigenfunction and this class? You might have expected the quantum wave function to be concentrated in a circle, something of that sort. But it doesn't look like that. Why is that? The reason is, is that we made this an eigenfunction of the operator x hat, the guiding center position. But the, the guiding center y position does not commute with x. In fact, they're like a q and a p apart from the scaling factor, or an x and a p. And so by constructing a state in which the value of, of x hat, of, of the observable x, is known precisely, it means that the value of the corresponding y observable is completely unknown. And that's why it has to stretch out to infinity plus or minus infinity in the y direction. It's the uncertainty principle is forcing this, forcing this harness. If we had chosen y, capital Y, guiding center y is the, instead of x, as the, uh, as the first observable, then we would have gotten a mountain range going in the other direction. Because then, then y would have been known that x would be completely unknown. Uh, there's a homework problem in which you don't use either y or x, but you use angular momentum. And if you do that, you find a wave function is rotationally invariant around the, around the origin. It still doesn't look like the classical motion because the circle in the classical motion doesn't have to be in the origin. It can be anywhere in the world. Um, but anyway, at least it doesn't go to infinity. So anyway, these are all aspects of, of this problem. There are ways of constructing energy eigenfunctions that do look like the classical motion, but I I don't think I want to go into it. Um, here's another curious thing about this problem. is that the xy plane, if I talk about the particle coordinates x and y, of course, it's just an ordinary configuration space, and the x and y variables commute, so they can be measured simultaneously. If, however, we talk about the guiding center xy plane, uh, those are operators that don't commute. And in fact, the commutator is, uh, is IH bar times a constant, so they look like an X and a P. In other words, the guiding center XY plane is, is really more like a phase space than it is like a configuration space. And by the way, the same thing is true for the VX and VY variables, which don't commute either. They're like another phase space in a different dimension. Uh, in fact, this the circle, the classical orbit is a circle in velocity space. This is actually like the circular orbit of a harmonic oscillator in phase space in the classical, in the classical picture. Well, in any case, to go back to the guiding center variables, x and y, this is, it's like, it's like a, it, in some respects, it's like a phase space. There's one thing we know about a phase space, which is that there's a concept of a quant cell. A quant cell is a cell that has an area, which is equal to 2 pi h bar, and it's the area that supports a single quantum state. This is a semi rough semi-classical rule. Well, um, the, the x and y variables aren't quite q's and p's. There's a one of the root of the omega involved in them. So a flunk cell in the guiding center plane is going to be a cell in which delta q1 times delta q2, that's the phase space area, <coughs> is equal to 2 pi h bar. So let's talk about flunk cells. This is what this would be the condition for it. <coughs> However, from this formula here, delta Q and delta P are square root of m omega times delta X and delta Y. So this is the same thing as m omega times uh, delta X delta Y. So that's the same thing as m omega is equal to EB uh, over C delta X delta Y. And B times delta X delta Y is the magnetic flux through the area of, that, of the X and Y plane. And so what we find is, is the flux through a single Planck cell, B delta X delta Y, is equal to 2 by H bar over here times C over E, uh, which is more usually written this way as HC over E. HC over E is a unit of magnetic flux, and it's called the flux quantum. And uh, this is actually an important concept in various condensed matter applications, uh, quantum Hall effect and so on, where you have not just one particle, but electrons, you have lots of them. 
in magnetic fields. And the quantum states, the, 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 well, the ground state of the land model, for example, fills up the area with, a, with, one, with one state per Planck cell. But, this, but the Planck cell is an area of the XY plane and, and it captures a single flux quantum of magnetic flux, which is HC over D. Anyway, it's a very common concept. The, the, um, the terminology is a little bit bad because uh, it, the, um, the magnetic flux is not quantized. Uh, this is just merely a natural unit of magnetic flux that emerges in problems, quantum problems involving magnetic fields. Uh, but magnetic flux can take on any value uh, whatsoever. Anyway, that's the meaning of the flux quantum, HC over E. Now, that's all I want to say about the uh, charged particle in a uh, uniform magnetic field. And I'd like to turn to another problem involving magnetic fields, uh, which um, I guess I'll do here. And um, this is the hard uh, bone effect, uh, which is interesting because it challenges our understanding of the role of magnetic vector potentials in quantum mechanics. The hard enough bone effect, uh, AB effect, uh, dates from about 1961. It's uh, sort of surprising nobody thought of this earlier. Uh, there's, uh, in a sense, there's nothing much to it. It's just solving the Schrodinger. Nobody invents a new Schrodinger equation or any new physics. It's just solving the Schrodinger equation in some standard way. But uh, the results were surprising to uh, uh, some people anyway. Anyway, the situation. Uh, the uh, situation involved is uh, that of a charged particle moving in the field of a long, thin solenoid, or a long solenoid. Uh, a long solenoid is a standard problem in, in electromagnetic theory, so I assume you've seen it already. Uh, let's take the solenoid looking like this. It actually is supposed to, and ideally, it extends to infinity in both directions. Let's take the z direction that's pointing up and put coordinates x and y on this. I'll also, uh, I'll, also use, uh, uh, I'll also use cylindrical coordinates uh, when it's convenient. This is uh, rho, phi, and z, where uh, rho is the radius in the xy plane, square root of x squared plus y squared. But in any case, the solenoid is supposed to have a current sheet, a singular current sheet, flowing uh, in the azimuthal direction around the solenoid. And the result is if you get a magnetic field in the interior of the solenoid, constant uniform magnetic field, with zero magnetic field outside. So the magnetic field is equal to, let's just say magnitude V times Z hat, if the radius is less than the radius of the solenoid, let's call that A as the radius of the solenoid. In fact, allow me to make another picture and look at this from above. We look at the solenoid from above, so we, in the xy plane, I'll draw the solenoid some more hard and now. Let's say the radius is A, like this. So if you're inside, the magnetic field is constant. If you're outside, the magnetic field is zero. Okay. Now, uh, in classical mechanics, a charged particle moving in the exterior region of the solenoid would not, would not feel the solenoid at all because there's no magnetic field there, so there's no force in the particle. Part, part, charged particles are moving straight line trajectories. Um, what's interesting is, is that there is an effect in quantum mechanics, as we'll see in just a moment. Uh, to uh, look at the quantum mechanics, of course, we're going to need a vector potential because that's what appears in the Schrodinger equation. So let's find a vector potential for this magnetic field. Uh, we'll do this in, this in this manner. It turns out that you can find a vector potential which is purely in the phi direction. And we get the vector potential by doing an integral around a closed loop at some radius around the solenoid. So let's integrate around some uh, loop of A dot BL. And that's equal to the radius, excuse me, the circumference of the, of the loop, which is 2 pi rho times A phi. Uh, however, by Stokes theorem, this is also equal to the uh, magnetic flux. It's the integral of B dot dA over the surface, the enclosed, the enclosed surface. And that's the same as the magnetic flux, which is enclosed by the loop. 
Well, the magnetic flux is caused by the loop depends on whether the loop is inside the solenoid or whether it's outside. These dotted lines are two examples of, of loops we're going to be thinking about here, like this, like this. If the loop is inside the solenoid, then it picks up the flux which is inside the loop. So in that case, what we get is the area of the loop, which is pi rho squared times the magnetic field. This is the case of rho is less than a. And if the loop is outside the solenoid, then we pick up the magnetic flux from the entire solenoid at radius a, but nothing beyond that because there's, there's no magnetic field beyond that. So in this case, it just turns into pi a squared times b for rho greater than a. And so dividing by 2 pi rho, we can solve for the vector potential and we find a phi is equal to b over 2 times rho if rho is less than a, and then b over 2 times a squared over rho if rho is greater than a. And so we can make a plot. It's a function of rho, a sub rho. Rho in here, the radius rho equals a. Uh, out to in the inside, interior solution is proportional. A phi is proportional to rho, so it's just it's a straight line like this. And then the exterior solution that falls off is one over rho, so it decays like this. If we plot similarly the magnetic field on the same on the same chart, the same dot, type of dot diagram, it's constant interior and zero outside, just like that. So, although the magnetic field is zero outside the solenoid, the vector potential is non-zero. And the vector potential appears in the Schrodinger equation. And so the question is, is that going to affect the quantum mechanics of particles which are outside the solenoid? Uh, to make this a little more concrete, we can imagine that the solenoid is like a hard wall that the particles can't get through. So uh, we've got a kind of, we had a quantum mechanical problem, if I look at it from above, We've got a quantum mechanical problem in which the wave function uh, is equal to zero. It's a boundary condition on the, the edge of the solenoid. And uh, we're going to be interested then in solving the Schrodinger equation in the exterior region. We don't care what happens in the interior because the particles don't get in there. Okay, so let's think about doing that. Well, uh, from one point of view, you might be tempted to say, um, in this exterior region, we have a non-zero vector potential. It's true. This is what I just worked out here. But this is just one choice of gauge. Obviously, if you have a zero magnetic field, the possible choice of gauge is just A equals zero, because curl of zero is zero. So why don't we do a gauge transformation to get rid of this vector potential and end up with A equals zero. And then in the exterior region, we ought to have just the Schrodinger equation for a free particle, and the magnetic field wouldn't make any difference. Well, let's try to do that. So the vector potential we've got is this one here, this five component, and I'm just talking about the exterior region. It's b a squared over 2 times rho times phi hat. Let me multiply numerator, numerator and denominator by phi, because then phi a squared b is the magnetic flux inside the solenoid, so it's phi over 2 phi times rho times phi hat. It's what so it's one over rho. One over rho times phi hat. Uh, as we say, uh, this uh, this uh, vector potential is pure gauge. It can be gauged by gauge transformation, it can be eliminated. That means it must be equal to the gradient of some scalar f. And what is that scalar f? Well, the scalar f is proportional to the azimuthal angle phi. Don't confuse the magnetic flux capital phi with the, uh, the azimuthal angle phi. If you compute the gradient of phi, just do it in cylindrical coordinates, you'll find it's equal to phi hat divided by rho, which is precisely what we had here. And so the f here, which is the, of which a is the gradient, to summarize this, we can write the vector potential in the exterior region, is actually equal to the gradient of a scalar, which is the flux of the solenoid divided by 2 pi times the azimuthal angle phi. Okay. 
And do recall that when you do a gauge transformation or a wave function, it goes into psi times e to the i q over h bar c times the gauge scalar f. The gauge scalar f is going to be the flux over 2 pi times the as equal angle phi. And um, so the result is I'm writing that for So the result is in this attempt to gauge away the vector potential in the exterior region, uh, what we end up with is, uh, is a new wave function, uh, which uh, is related to the old wave function by a phase factor that goes like the azimuthal angle. More specifically, it's this. The new wave function or the transformation is this. It becomes e to the, e to the i q over h bar c. Uh, times uh, the, uh, the function f is, uh, where did I write it down? Where did I write it down? The function f is the flux phi over 2 pi times, times angle phi. So that is 2 pi h bar c. Times angle phi, flux capital phi times angle phi. Uh, Q over 2 pi h bar c is the same thing as Q over HC, which is 1 over what I'll call phi 0, where phi 0 is the same flux quantum that we saw in the, uh, in the um, charged particle in the uniform field. So this can be written this way as psi times E to the I capital phi over phi naught uh, times the S uniform angle phi, like this. Now, the um, trouble is, you see, is, is that when you go completely around, then phi over phi naught is not an integer, you get a discontinuity of phi. Yes. Let me do that gauge uh, transformation. What would happen to the vector potential inside the solenoid? Would that not get changed? Well, I'm, uh, I'm glossing over that because I'm saying, suppose we just want to solve the Schrodinger equation in the exterior region. So I'm supposing let's just try to do a gauge transformation there to get rid of it. If you do that, what you find is, is that the new wave function is related to the old wave function times a factor, which is the flux in the solenoid divided by a flux quantum times the azimuthal angle. Now, if this ratio is not an integer, then the new wave function is, is, is discontinuous. That's, that's a problem. If it's discontinuous in the moment of its infinite, you've got problems with that. So let me not go into the problems of the discontinuities of the wave function, but, the, but this is a reflection of the fact that it's not going to work to gauge away the vector potential in the exterior region, even though the magnetic field is zero out there. Another way of saying it is, is that if, I've got the, if, I, if I were able to do a gauge transformation to get rid of the vector potential in the exterior region, then obviously the integral, uh, the, the loop integral of a dot dl would be equal to zero, because if a was equal to zero, this would certainly be equal to zero. But that can't be right because this integral must be equal to the flux, which is contained in the solenoid. So the result is, is you cannot gauge away the uh, you cannot gauge away the vector potential in the exterior region. It has to do with topology, really, the fact that the that there is a hole in the space. That's really what makes the difference about being unable to do this. All right. Let me not follow this any further, except just to say that the result of this is, is that there's a phase shift. Uh, any effect on going around the solenoid compared to the free particle solutions. And the phase shift is precisely this. If I replace this by 2 pi uh, going around the solenoid. The phase shift is this. It's the ratio of the flux to a flux quantum times 2 pi. And what you find is that solutions in the presence of that vector potential compared to solutions, free particle solutions, when there's no vector potential, differ by this phase shift on going around the solenoid. Now, let me show you how this might have an effect physically. It does have an effect physically. This is maybe the most dramatic physical uh, uh, effect uh, way, of, way of describing the effect of this. Let's consider a double slit experiment where we have, let's say, plane waves coming in like this. And there's two holes. And you know what will happen is you get waves radiating from the holes here. And then you've got a screen, down, uh, screen downstream from this. And as you know, you'll get an interference pattern here. And the, uh, the crests are the places where the phase difference coming from the two holes is a, is a uh, 
is an integer multiple of 2 pi, so that the two waves are in phase with one another. Now, let's modify the experiment by putting an hard on bone solenoid right there behind the screen. This part of it has never seen the solenoid, they never come close to it, they're just passing through the holes. But because of the presence of the solenoid, the solutions in the presence of the, in the, in the, presence of the solenoid have this extra phase factor, compared relative phase, from going around the two sides of the solenoid compared to the three particle solutions. And what that means is, is the relative phase of these two waves shifts by precisely this amount. That is to say, phi divided by the flux quantum phi naught times 2 pi. That's the, that's the phase shift. The extra phase shift that's induced between these two waves. And so what happens is, is that the interference pattern moves to the right or the left, depending on the flux in the solenoid. And if we make this time dependent by changing the current in this, we can move this interference pattern back and forth. Now the point of this is, is that the interference pattern is physically observable. So this is a physical effect uh, which appears in quantum, it's purely a quantum effect, there's nothing classic, no, nothing analogous classically, um, uh, which is, uh, occurs in a, in a situation in which the charged particles never enter a region where there's a non-zero magnetic field. And so this is what Harnoff and Baum pointed out in 1961, and some people said, oh, it's no big deal, it's just a solution to the Schrodinger equation. And other people said, oh, this is the greatest thing. So anyway, I think there's still kind of a skitzy uh, uh, attitude about the r and bone effect. But it certainly is interesting, and this is, and this is, what, uh, this is what it predicts. Now, by the way, the r and bone effect has been, has been actually experimentally verified. Um, as usual, with canonical experiments, the real experiments are, are, have to be, for practical reasons, have to be somewhat different. But uh, the uh, r and bone effect has been, has been verified experimentally. So there's no question that this sort of thing actually really does happen. All right. I'm sorry. Yes. I think I misunderstood. When you finished um, this P transformation thing, you said, so this is wrong. And then now you're saying that it's right. Uh, no, what I said was that uh, what I said was that it's impossible. If, you see, if it were possible to gauge away the vector potential in the exterior region, then the Schrodinger equation in the exterior region would be that of a free particle. Yeah. With with no with no effect at all. In which case the interference pattern would be just what you'd always get for a, you know, what you've always learned about double slit experiments. But the point is that if I put the solenoid in there and turn it on so I've got a magnetic flux, then there's an extra phase shift between these two waves. So then computing where the peaks occur, you have to include an extra shift. Now it's a relative shift between the two waves. So it's a, it's a relative phase shift. Remember, the phase of the quantum wave, I mean, we may, we may like to think that there's spherical waves coming out of here. And these spherical waves, of course, the wave fronts are the lines of constant phase. But who defines the phase? Um, it's easy enough that there's no vector potential around. You just say, you know, for A equals zero, it's just these are just spherical waves, you know, where, where, where e to the IKR coming out, coming out of here, e to the IKR over R. Uh, but in the presence of a vector potential, you know, then you have to specify a gauge, and the phase of the wave function depends on the gauge, and it changes if you do it if you do a gauge transformation. So, what the wave fronts are depends on your phase convention. As weird as it sounds, that's true. But the phase the phases themselves are not measurable. What's measurable are phase differences. And the phase difference between these two routes even in the presence of the solenoid, depends only on the flux in the solenoid. And the flux in the solenoid depends on D, not on A. So it's a gauge invariant quantity. So what's physically measurable is, is, is gauge invariant. So although the vector potential plays a more uh, fundamental role in, in, in quantum physics than it does in, in classical physics, it still remains true that, it, that the a gauge convention is still just a convention and that the real physics doesn't depend on that convention. The real physics here is the phase shift, the relative phase shift between waves, and that depends only on, on the flux, the flux of the solenoid. Well, we're so out of time, I, I, uh, I, uh, I didn't, uh, didn't really have time to go into what else I wanted to talk about, which is how this appears in the path integral formulation. Uh, let me just say that in the path integral formulation, you know, you, you, have, you have a phase in the path integral, it's e to the i over h bar is a little over time of the Lagrangian. Let's say t0 to t1. And uh, this is integrated over path space in the x of t, we're doing the path integral. 
propagator K. And the Lagrangian has two terms. It has a kinetic energy, which is M times M times uh, X dot, M over 2 times X dot squared, for the path. And then it has another term, which is Q over C times X dot dotted into the vector potential. And we can call this, let's say, L0, which is the free particle contribution of the world. And let's call this LM, which is the magnetic contribution of the world. So in comparison with the path integral for a free particle, of course, with the solenoid in the center and a hard wall on it, the particles, in a sense, is only free in the exterior region. But we can accommodate that in the path integral just by taking paths that never, never interject the, 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 the forbidden region. So let's understood that here in the path space we integrate. So then all we've got here is just the free particle of Lagrangian plus the magnetic particle of Lagrangian. But the magnetic particle of Lagrangian, it turns out, is, uh, is independent of the path up to a, up to a uh, it's largely independent of the path. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say that here's our hard off bone solenoid. Let's say here's the position x0, here's the position x1. And we've got a path that connects the two of them. And let's define the magnetic action as being the integral along the path of the magnetic contribution to the Lagrangian. Let's call this AM. It stands for magnetic. It's a function of the path, X of T. And this is, the, this is Q over C times the integral T0 to T1 of A dotted into the velocity x dot dt. Well, this turns into a line integral. It's q over c, the integral from x0 to x1, simply a dot dx. And so you see the time parameterization drops out. And the, magnet, the magnetic contribution of the action does not depend on how fast the particle traverses this path. Actually, it depends on even less than that. Because if I have two paths, let's call them P1 and P2, <coughs> such that they can be continuously deformed into one another, then the magnetic action along these two paths is the same. Because if I go along one path and back along the other, that gives me a loop integral, which is equal to the magnetic flux through the enclosed region. But this is entirely in the exterior region where the magnetic field is zero. So if you stay in the exterior region and you continuously deform one path into another, you don't change the magnetic action. <coughs> and so the magnetic action for paths of that sort can be taken, actually taken out of, taken out of the path integral. Well, not quite, because there are paths for which the magnetic action is not the same. It's called this P3. These are paths that, relative to the initial path, go around the solenoid. In fact, if we deform this path continuously, we can turn it into this, partially follow P1, and make an excursion over here, go around, come back, and then follow P1 again. So we go backwards and forwards like this. If we do this, then the magnetic action along P3 is equal to the magnetic action along P1, plus Q over C times the flux in the solenoid. And so the result is in the path integral, you can break paths up into what are called homotopy classes. These are the classes that, um, that indicate how many times it goes around the solenoid. And all paths that belong to the same homotopy class give the same magnetic action, and that can actually be taken out of the path integral. Anyway, the result is that the path integral becomes a free particle path integral taken over taken over uh, paths belonging to a single homotopy class, multiplied by a phase factor, which is precisely this hard on bone phase, exactly this here, times an integer. So it becomes P e to I N phi over phi naught. And this is the phase factor that distinguishes one homotopy class from the other. Anyway, of doing this, it becomes obvious that the propagators in the presence of the solenoid is not the same as it was in the absence of the solenoid. Okay, I think that's all.
so uh, just to remind you that the role of class this week, uh, and I'll be out of town, there's a few more homeworks here. Number, I don't know which one is there.